Okay, hello, I'm Mike Whipper, and I'm gonna talk about abandoned buildings and exploring them, the sense of adventure and discovery I get from all of these places. When I first was trying to figure out what I was gonna talk about and how I would, I knew some ideas that I wanted to bring up, but I didn't know exactly how I wanted to present them to you. I could simply talk about the wonder that these buildings inspire in me and tell you all to go out and explore them for yourselves. But in that case, I'd feel like I'm imposing my hobby on you, and you may not want to. In addition to that, there's the issue of the law, because in a lot of cases, I am trespassing, I am doing something illegal, and I wouldn't want to put any of you at that risk. Oops. Oh. So what I want to do is just show you the beauty and the emotion and the wonder that these buildings and places evoke in me, and perhaps explain to you, and maybe even myself, why I continue to go back to these places, why they humble me, and why they engage me in such a way that I really can't get enough. I want to start out by showing you some abandoned spaces that you probably all have heard of. The Colosseum, Machu Picchu, Berlin, Nevada, one of the many ghost towns that litters the West, and the RMS Titanic. And apart from Bob Ballard, these places, um, or exception, with exception of the last one, other than Bob Ballard, these places that are um, areas that we can all visit and we can all go. And you can buy a ticket, you can experience it for yourself, and learn firsthand what these places have to offer. They're a part of marketable history, and we have a lot of respect for people who, who study these fields. Um, we've deemed them culturally important, and academia is filled with people who want to study. But my argument is that these places are all around us. I've experienced a ton of history in these places, just as much as you can get from any of those more famous abandoned places. I remember asking my dad, he's that one, and that's me, if in case you were confused. Um, <laughs> I, wanted, I, I asked him when I was younger, um, if there's anything left to be explored, if there's some island in the middle of the Atlantic or the Pacific that we haven't seen yet, with civilizations we've never heard of, and with artifacts that we've never found. And he answered me in kind of the father way of saying, well, I'm sure there is, and you should go find it. And I wanted to be that person. I imagined some type of island like this, in the middle of the Atlantic or Pacific, with palm trees, beaches, a lost island that we've never seen or anyone set foot on. I imagine some type of idol, like in Indiana Jones, being on the island, and I would arrive and find it and bring it back to a museum or something like that. But soon I found out about Google Earth, and I found out that you could zoom into any point on the ocean and see exactly what's there, and that, you know, I couldn't really find an island that nobody had ever seen before. I wouldn't be like Hiram Bingham, the famous explorer who found Machu Picchu. That kind of old-fashioned adventure was gone. That disappointed me in some ways, and I kind of forgot about my sense of adventure and discovery. I put my efforts into other areas, and although I always had an energy and a drive to uh, discover and to have adventure, it was in a different context. But I found out about abandoned buildings, in part by watching the Ranson Riggs short film, The Accidental Sea, about the Salton Sea in California that was basically a resort town that kind of popped up overnight in the late 50s and then vanished due to a number of um, social factors, a number of environmental factors. But what I saw in his photos and in the video was that this beauty and exploration and adventure is all around us. These buildings, as you can see here, are not commercialized. They're not, there's no ticket booth, there's no person ensuring your safety. I could explore at my own pace, with my own rules, and figure out exactly which rooms I want to go in. And in a way, I could see the end of the world come early, the apocalypse come early, as I like to say, a world without humans, a world after us. You really feel like you're stepping back in time when you go in these buildings. They're falling apart, but in a lot of cases, they're very well preserved. As you can see here, the desks are exactly where they were the day they were left. You find clocks, chairs, tables, books, paper, exactly where they were when they were abandoned, upwards of 70, 80, even 100 years ago. I want to bring up urban exploration as a word, because exploration is in the title, and it, I do see it as the cornerstone. These buildings are often abandoned due to social shifts or kind of changes in the norms that we see in society. The classic example that I've explored a lot and bring up are the asylums of the Northeast. 
This photo is actually one I found at one of the asylums, just on an um, old slide. And it shows you kind of what it looked like in the day. And so throughout the years that they were popular, originally they were considered cutting edge, kind of um, the best of their time in terms of dealing with people with mental illness or other kind of ailments. Um, but eventually, as they grew older, questions of ethics, abuses, and the effectiveness of them um, put an end to them. And over many, or not, not many years, they were rapidly shut down. And for that reason, they were abandoned. People didn't want to repurpose them because they had the stigma of being associated with the past. And in a lot of cases, they were still on state-owned property. So nobody could just buy them up. In these places, um, you really feel the weight of time. You see history forgotten by time and history we don't want to remember, like the asylums. In my way and in my feeling, exploring abandoned buildings is the closest thing we have to time travel. Museums give you a very constructed view of what history was like. And in a lot of cases, it's simulated. It has artifacts that are real, but you're not actually at the place. You can't really look back into what it was like. Also, museums have biases. They choose to cover some things. And history shouldn't have a bias. It should be an objective nature. But unfortunately, when humans create a museum and choose to forget and remember some things, it creates a bias. There's natural aging in these places. You can't sterilize or sugarcoat the type of things you're going to see. Museums can um, sugarcoat an issue or sterilize something that's very um, profound and impactful. But in these buildings, you see them exactly how they are. You're not seeing them exactly how they were um, in the time. You're seeing them with all the decay. But in, the, in a sense, you're seeing them as they were meant to be, the trajectory of their abandonment. There's a lot of history locked in these places, in the raw form. And I think that these can bring you a closer look into history than any movie or any photo or any book can bring you. You experience the past not exactly how it was, but a past that's unaffected by modern influence. And what I mean by that is in these buildings, although there's decay, although there's um, paint chipping, walls falling apart, and plants crawling in through the windows, um, you're seeing them unaffected by modern times. There's not a commercialization, there's not a sugar coating, as I always mention. You're seeing them unaffected by today. Simply the aging and decay, the natural aging of decay and nature and time. In these places, you really feel the full weight of history. You see how long and how of a profound effect time, uh, time can have on these places. These, these spaces almost feel like glitches in the world where everything is controlled, everything's regulated. We have institutes that protect our safety. Even these buildings, as Spencer mentioned, fire exits. There's, there's a procedure for things like this. But in these buildings, it's so out of control. Nothing that was meant to serve and protect us is valid in these spaces. I think what really keeps me coming back is that kind of grounding and humbling feeling I get. You feel how out of control the world really is. We like to think that humans are in control and that nature is almost secondary to humans. But overall, nature is the dominant force. You can leave these buildings for five, 10 years, and nature will find a way to take them over and crawl in. We leave a kind of human empty shell with these spaces, and nature comes in and creates something of their own. You get to see the natural state of the world without humans. Um, it's amazing how nature reclaims these spaces and so quickly. We spend so much energy to protect our buildings, to protect them from the elements, from nature, but exerting almost no energy, nature can take them over. You leave them alone and a storm blows open a window, the seeds of the plants come in and they begin to grow. The way the paint chips, the way the plants crawl in, in a way I see it as almost us. The buildings are us, and eventually we will all die someday. And in that way, we're being reclaimed by nature. And when I go in these buildings, it really humbles me, and I remember that. We often don't think about that today, but these buildings offer a very valuable and often not utilized chance to see that. You have a unique feeling when you enter these buildings of both freshness and age. In the age way, you're discovering old rooms that haven't been entered in for decades. You can often put a date on when they were last abandoned. Um, I usually try to look up the history about buildings that I enter, and I can tell exactly when they were abandoned, for what reason, and I can put a date, in many cases, the last time anybody has seen these places. In many ways, um, these buildings represent um, our own views of life and death. They're left alone by humans in the kind of 
um, shell that I talked about, and nature comes in and creates. And that's the freshness you feel. You go into these buildings, and there's something new about them. Although they're old, and by every sense of the word, abandoned, old, there's still a freshness to them. There's a new creation that nature has given us. Um, they're built for people, but they're no longer used for people. Nature has taken them over. And it's, it puts, like I mentioned, a really weird feeling. You're walking through the hallways, and you see light switches that will never work again. You see desks that won't be written at. You see books that won't be read. And all these things are meant for humans, but now are completely non-human in a way. They're just part of the, the kind of atmospheric background. What I hope to offer with my talk is kind of a, a humbling experience and a chance to give ourselves an alternative look of the world around us. We have to remind ourselves of how out of control the world is um, and how, how much we try to take control, although we can't, to show how easily nature can reclaim these spaces and to give a clear look into how the world will be without us. I think this has very important implications nowadays because with global warming and all sorts of social issues, these offer a very real chance of what the world will look like in even decades in some cases, depending on how close we get to wars or you know, just any type of natural disaster or man-made disaster. It's real, we can see the effects, and it's right now. Above all, I just wanna say, to kind of end my talk, to keep exploring. We've all seen, the, uh, and we will see, the many talks here that give a different definition of what exploring, discovery, and adventure is to the person. For me, it's this, but not everybody's going to find something in this, whether it's um, interest in counterterrorism, underwater exploration, business adventure, any type of wandering and pursuit of something. There's, there's an intrinsic value to that. We all need to find what we want to discover, what we want to pursue. And I just want to say to keep exploring, keep the spirit of adventure, exploration alive, create and not destroy. Thank you. Thank you.